It started as any other day. I came home early from work, eager to surprise my wife, Emily. She'd been distant lately, distracted even. We'd been married for years, and while our passion had cooled over time, I never suspected she would betray me. That afternoon, I found out just how wrong I was. As I approached the front door, I noticed her car was already in the driveway, an odd sight considering she usually worked later than I did. A cold dread settled in my stomach, the kind you get when you know something is about to go horribly wrong. I turned the key in the lock, pushing the door open as quietly as I could, and stepped inside, the house was eerily silent, but as I climbed the stairs, I heard faint whispers coming from our bedroom. My heart pounded in my chest as I crept closer. Through the small crack in the door, I saw them, Emily and him. They were tangled in each other's arms, whispering sweet nothings that made my blood boil that I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. Rage welled up inside me, but it was mixed with a cold, calculating clarity. I watched them for what felt like an eternity, their betrayal sinking in deeper with every second. I should have stormed in, should have confronted them then and there. But I didn't. Instead, I backed away, quietly slipping down the stairs and out of the house that I sat in my car, the image of them burned into my mind. I should have been shattered, devastated, but all I felt was numb. And beneath that numbness, a dark plan began to take shape, that night, I stayed at a hotel. I didn't call Emily, didn't text her. I needed time to think, to plot my next move. My thoughts were consumed with one thing, revenge.by the next morning, I had a plan. It was simple, really. I would become him, the lover she had chosen over me. And then, when the time was right, I would reveal the truth. And Emily, well, she would pay for what she had done, over the next few days, I kept my distance from Emily, letting her believe I was busy with work. It wasn't difficult, she was preoccupied with her new lover, after all. But every night, I sat in the dark of my hotel room, meticulously studying him, his name was Michael, some nobody she'd met at her office. I found him on social media, his pages filled with photos of him posing in trendy bars and flashing a smug smile that made me sick. It wasn't long before I knew everything about him, where he lived, where he worked, his friends, his routines. I even started copying his style, the way he dressed, the way he talked, during the day, I'd go to work as usual, acting like nothing had changed. But at night, I'd slip into my new role, crafting messages to Emily from a burner phone I'd bought, pretending to be Michael. I knew their relationship was still fresh, still fragile. It didn't take much to manipulate her, to create doubt, to make her question his intentions. At first, the messages were subtle, sweet texts she thought were from him. I can't stop thinking about you, I'd type, knowing how much those words would mean to her. And she would respond with the same eagerness, unaware that it was me on the other end, then I started to change the tone, just slightly. I'd hint at things Michael had never said, things that would make her second guess everything. Do you really know who I am? I wrote one night. What if I'm not who you think I am? She seemed confused at first, her responses slower, more cautious. But she played along, probably thinking it was some game he was playing but the game was just beginning that it was time to step up my plan. I needed to get closer to Michael, to learn more than just the surface details. I started following him, shadowing his movements without him ever noticing. It was almost too easy. He was predictable, stuck in a routine that made him an easy target point one night, I followed him to a bar he frequented. He sat alone, nursing a drink, oblivious to the danger lurking nearby. I watched him for hours, studying the way he moved, the way he interacted with the bartender. Finally, as the bar began to empty, I made my move that I approached him casually, striking up a conversation like any other patron. Michael was friendly, too friendly. He invited me to sit, bought me a drink, and soon we were chatting like old friends. I mirrored his gestures, mimicked his tone, and he didn't suspect a thing, after a few drinks, I suggested we go outside for a smoke. Michael agreed, staggering slightly as we stepped into the alleyway behind the bar. The moment we were alone, I struck. 
A swift blow to the back of his head, and he crumpled to the ground like a ragdoll that I stood over him, breathing heavily, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and exhilaration. This was it. I was crossing a line I could never uncross. But there was no turning back now that I dragged Michael's unconscious body to my car, the darkness of the alley swallowing us whole. I drove to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town, a place where no one would hear his screams. I had prepared everything in advance, duct tape, rope, a tarp to cover the floor, when Michael woke up, he was gagged and bound to a chair, his eyes wide with terror. I leaned in close, savoring the fear in his eyes as I whispered in his ear Emily is mine, I hissed. And now, so is your life, with that, I ended him, quickly, efficiently. There was no pleasure in it, just a cold, clinical satisfaction. I disposed of his body, making sure there would be nothing left to find. As far as the world was concerned, Michael had simply disappeared, that night, I returned to my hotel room, exhausted but alive with a new energy. I had become him. I was now Michael, and I was ready to continue the charade. Emily would never know the difference, until it was too late, the days that followed felt surreal, like I was living someone else's life. In a way, I was. I became Michael in every sense, using the details I had gleaned from his life to craft the perfect illusion. Emily had no idea her lover was now a ghost, and I took perverse pleasure in watching her fall deeper into my web that I kept up the charade through texts and emails, slipping seamlessly into his role. Every message was carefully crafted, each one a thread in the intricate trap I was weaving. I'm thinking of you, I'd write, imagining the way she'd smile at her phone. Can't wait to see you again, she responded eagerly, as if she couldn't get enough of him. Of me that I started sending her gifts, things I knew Michael would never have thought to give. Small tokens of affection, reminders that I was always thinking of her. A bouquet of her favorite flowers, a book by her favorite author, little things that would make her believe Michael was truly invested in their relationship. She was falling for it all, hook, line, and sinker but the real deception came when I took it a step further. I started to arrange secret meetings, always in places where I could watch from a distance. I'd tell her to meet Michael at a cafe or a park, knowing she'd be excited to see him. But when she arrived, there would be no one there, just a note or a small gift left behind, with a message like, sorry, got caught up. Let's meet again soon, the confusion on her face, the disappointment, was delicious. I could see the doubt starting to creep in, the uncertainty. But she never confronted him, me, directly. Instead, she tried to convince herself that it was all part of some romantic game, that Michael was just being playful, but the tension was building, and I knew it was only a matter of time before she'd start asking questions. That's when I made my next move point one evening, I sent her a message that was different from the others. Meet me at the old warehouse on the edge of town, I wrote. I have something special planned for us, the warehouse was where I had disposed of Michael, where the air still hung heavy with the secrets I had buried there. It was the perfect place for the final act of my plan, Emily hesitated at first, asking why such a strange location. But I reassured her with more sweet lies, telling her it was all part of the surprise, that she would love what I had in store. Reluctantly, she agreed, that night, I prepared everything meticulously. The warehouse was dark and empty, a forgotten relic of the past that now served my twisted purposes. I arranged the scene carefully, making sure everything was in place. I couldn't afford any mistakes when Emily arrived, she looked nervous, glancing around the shadowy building as she stepped inside. The sound of her heels clicking on the concrete floor echoed in the vast space, each step bringing her closer to me, Michael, she called out, her voice trembling slightly that I stayed hidden in the shadows, watching as she ventured further into the warehouse. The anticipation was electric, my heart pounding in my chest. This was it. The moment I had been waiting for, Michael. She called again, her voice more insistent, finally, I stepped out from the darkness, letting her see me for the first time. Her face lit up with relief when she saw me, or who she thought was Michael. She rushed forward, wrapping her arms around me, her warmth seeping into my cold, 
calculating skin, I was so worried, she murmured into my chest. Why here? What's going on, I pulled back slightly, looking down at her. For a moment, I almost faltered. Almost. But then I remembered why I was doing this, and the cold resolve returned. There's something I need to show you, I said, taking her hand and leading her deeper into the warehouse, she followed willingly, trusting me completely. I led her to the spot where I had prepared everything, where the truth would finally be revealed. Michael, what is this? she asked, confusion creasing her brow as she saw the setup, a single chair in the center of the room, a small table beside it with a covered object resting on top that I guided her to the chair, gently pushing her down into it. Just sit tight, I said, my voice soft but firm. I have something to tell you, she looked up at me, a mix of curiosity and unease in her eyes. What is it? I smiled, but there was no warmth in it. Only the cold satisfaction of a plan coming to fruition, Emily, I said, my voice low, almost a whisper. There's something you need to know about Michael, her eyes widened slightly, fear creeping in around the edges. What do you mean? I reached for the object on the table, slowly lifting the cover to reveal what lay beneath. Her breath caught in her throat as she saw it, a small, blood-stained keepsake, something that had belonged to Michael. Michael isn't here anymore, I said, my voice as cold as the steel in my hand. He's gone. And I've been the one you've been talking to, all this time, her eyes widened in horror as the realization hit her, the truth crashing down like a tidal wave. She tried to pull away, but I grabbed her wrist, holding her in place, you took everything from me, I hissed, leaning in close, my face inches from hers. Now, it's time for you to pay, Emily's eyes locked onto mine, her breath quickening as panic set in. She yanked her wrist, trying to break free, but my grip was ironclad. The dim light of the warehouse cast eerie shadows across her face, amplifying the fear that had begun to consume her, please. I don't understand, she stammered, her voice trembling that I leaned in closer, so close that I could see the tears welling up in her eyes. Oh, you understand perfectly, I whispered, my voice dripping with malice. You thought you could replace me, that you could just toss me aside like I was nothing. But you never realized who you were really dealing with, did you? She shook her head, her tears spilling over as she whispered, Michael, Michael is dead, I spat, the words sharp as a blade. And I'm the one who killed him. I've been pretending to be him for weeks, Emily. You've been so blinded by your own selfish desires that you never even noticed, the horror in her eyes deepened as the full weight of my words sank in. No. No, this can't be real, she gasped, her voice barely above a whisper, oh, it's real, I said, letting go of her wrist and taking a step back. She didn't try to run, too paralyzed by the terror coursing through her veins. I could see her mind racing, trying to piece together the fragments of the nightmare I had constructed around her, you wanted Michael, I continued, circling her slowly like a predator stalking its prey. You betrayed me for him. And now, I've become everything you wanted, everything you thought you loved, I didn't. I didn't mean to hurt you, she cried, her hands trembling as she reached out toward me. Please, you have to believe me. I didn't know what I was doing, her pleas were pathetic, hollow. They only fueled the fire of my rage. You didn't mean to hurt me, I mocked, my voice rising. Do you even know how much you destroyed? You shattered our life, our trust, and for what? Some cheap thrill, Emily broke down, sobbing uncontrollably as the reality of the situation overwhelmed her. She clutched her head in her hands, shaking her head as if to deny what was happening. But there was no escape from the truth, look at me, I barked, grabbing her shoulders and forcing her to meet my gaze. You did this. You made me into this monster. And now, you're going to face the consequences, she looked up at me, her tear-streaked face a mask of desperation. Please, please don't do this, she begged. I'll do anything. Just let me go, I stared at her, my mind whirling with dark thoughts. For a brief moment, a sliver of doubt crept in. Was this really what I wanted? Was this how I wanted it to end? But the image of her with Michael, 
The sound of their whispered promises, pushed those doubts away that I reached into my pocket and pulled out a small, sharp knife. The sight of it made her eyes widen in terror. This is for every lie you told me, every moment you spent with him, I said, my voice trembling with emotion. This is for the life you stole from me, she shook her head frantically, trying to pull away, but I held her in place. Please, I'm sorry, she sobbed. I'm so sorry, for a moment, I hovered on the edge of the abyss, teetering between vengeance and mercy. The knife in my hand felt heavy, like the weight of all the pain she had caused me. My grip tightened around the handle as I wrestled with the darkness inside me but then, something unexpected happened. Emily's sobs subsided, and she looked up at me with a clarity that cut through the fog of my hatred. I was wrong, she said, her voice steady despite the tears. I was selfish and cruel. I never deserved your love. But this, this isn't you, her words struck a chord deep within me, a part of me that I thought had died long ago. I hesitated, the knife trembling in my hand. Was she right? Had I let my anger consume me to the point where I was no longer the person I once was? The person I wanted to be, the tension in the air was palpable, the moment stretched thin like a wire ready to snap. I could feel the abyss calling to me, the urge to plunge headlong into the darkness and never look back. But as I looked into her eyes, I saw something I hadn't expected, genuine remorse that I took a step back, the knife slipping from my grasp and clattering to the floor. The sound echoed through the empty warehouse, a sharp punctuation to the silence that followed. I stared down at the fallen blade, my mind racing with conflicting thoughts Emily didn't move, too afraid to believe that the nightmare might be over. She watched me warily, waiting for my next move. I could see the fear still etched on her face, but beneath it was something else, a glimmer of hope that I ran a hand through my hair, taking a deep, shaky breath. You're right, I muttered, my voice barely audible. This isn't who I am Emily's breath hitched, as if she couldn't believe what she was hearing. Then, then let me go, she whispered, her voice trembling with emotion that I looked at her, really looked at her, and for the first time in weeks, I saw the woman I had fallen in love with. The woman who had once been my whole world, before everything went wrong. And in that moment, I realized that my thirst for revenge had nearly destroyed us both, but as I turned away, ready to leave this madness behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still unfinished, unresolved. I had come this far, crossed so many lines, could I really just walk away now, and then, from the shadows of the warehouse, a soft, mocking laugh echoed around us. Emily's eyes widened in confusion, and I felt a chill run down my spine. The laugh grew louder, more menacing, until a figure emerged from the darkness that IT was Michael, the figure that stepped out from the shadows was unmistakably Michael, at least, that's what my eyes were telling me. He looked exactly as he had in life, every detail perfect. But I knew, I knew, that couldn't be right. Michael was dead. I had killed him myself. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at him, my mind racing to make sense of the impossible. Emily's breath caught in her throat, her eyes wide with a mixture of terror and disbelief. Michael, she whispered, her voice trembling that he smiled at her, a cold, twisted smile that sent a shiver down my spine. Yes, Emily, it's me, he said, his voice low and smooth, but there was something off about it, something that made my blood run cold. I've come back for you, I took a step back, instinctively reaching for the knife I had dropped earlier, but Michael, or whatever this thing was, suddenly turned his gaze on me. His eyes were dark, impossibly so, like bottomless pits that seemed to swallow the light, you thought you could get rid of me that easily, he sneered, taking a step closer. You thought you could just erase me and take my place, I couldn't speak, couldn't move. My mind was reeling, trying to process what was happening. This wasn't real, it couldn't be real. I had buried him, left no trace. And yet here he was, standing before me, very much alive, or something close to it, you're not Michael, I finally managed to say, my voice shaking. You can't be, he laughed, a deep, sinister sound that echoed through the warehouse. You're right, he said, his smile widening. I'm not Michael. But I have his memories, his face, 
and I have his unfinished business. Emily shrank back in her chair, her eyes darting between me and the creature that wore Michael's face. What do you want? she asked, her voice barely above a whisper, the thing that looked like Michael tilted its head, considering her for a moment before turning back to me. You see, it said, taking another step closer, I'm something much older, much darker than your pathetic little revenge plot. I was drawn to the hatred, the violence, the pure malice you felt when you killed Michael. It gave me, form, I stared at it, my stomach churning with a mix of horror and disbelief. This couldn't be happening. It was impossible. But the creature standing before me was very real, and the malevolence radiating from it was unmistakable and now, it continued, its voice dropping to a menacing whisper, I've come to collect what's mine, before I could react, it lunged at me with inhuman speed. I barely had time to grab the knife from the floor before it was on me, its cold hands wrapping around my throat. I gasped for breath, struggling against its impossible strength as it forced me to the ground. You wanted to become Michael, it hissed in my ear, its grip tightening. Now you'll take his place, forever. I could feel the life being squeezed out of me, darkness creeping in at the edges of my vision. My mind raced, desperately searching for a way out, a way to fight back. But the creature's grip was like iron, unyielding, unstoppable. That I in the corner of my eye, I saw Emily rise from the chair, her face a mask of terror and determination. She grabbed the knife from where I had dropped it, her hands trembling as she looked at the creature strangling me. For a moment, I thought she would run, would leave me to die at the hands of this nightmare. But instead, she stepped forward, her eyes blazing with a fierce resolve let him go, she screamed, and with a strength I didn't know she had, she drove the knife into the creature's back that I t let out an unearthly howl, its grip on me loosening just enough for me to break free. I gasped for air, my vision swimming as I scrambled to my feet. The creature staggered, the knife still embedded in its back, Black Icor seeping from the wound, Emily grabbed my arm, pulling me toward the exit. We have to get out of here, she shouted, her voice frantic, but the creature wasn't finished. It turned toward us, its face twisted in a grotesque mask of rage and pain. You think you can escape me, it roared, its voice echoing through the warehouse. You think you can defy me, with a flick of its hand, the warehouse doors slammed shut, trapping us inside. The creature advanced on us, its eyes burning with a dark, malevolent fire. You're both mine, it snarled, its voice like the grinding of stones, panic surged through me as I realized there was no way out, no escape from the horror that was closing in on us. Emily clung to me, her body shaking with fear, and I knew in that moment that I had to do something, anything, to protect her that I glanced around the warehouse, searching for something, anything I could use. And then I saw it, a heavy metal pipe lying discarded on the floor. Without thinking, I broke free from Emily's grasp and lunged for it, grabbing the pipe and swinging it with all my strength, the pipe connected with the creature's head with a sickening crunch, and it staggered back, momentarily stunned. But it wasn't enough to stop it. With a guttural growl, it lashed out at me, its claws raking across my chest. I cried out in pain, but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop that I swung the pipe again and again, each blow fueled by the fear and desperation coursing through me. The creature shrieked in fury, its form flickering like a dying flame. But it kept coming, kept fighting, its eyes blazing with a relentless hunger, Emily, get out, I shouted, my voice raw with pain and exhaustion. Run, but she didn't move. She stood her ground, her eyes locked on mine, as if she was trying to will me to keep fighting to survive. The creature lunged at me again, its claws outstretched, and I swung the pipe one last time, putting every ounce of strength I had left into the blow, the creature let out one final, ear-splitting shriek, and then its form dissolved into a cloud of darkness, swirling around us like a storm. I staggered back, gasping for breath as the darkness slowly dissipated, leaving nothing behind but the cold, empty warehouse, for a moment, there was only silence the kind of silence that follows a storm, heavy with the weight of what had just happened. I dropped the pipe, my hands shaking uncontrollably, and looked at Emily. She was staring at me, her face pale and streaked with tears, but she was alive. We both were dot we stood there, panting and bloodied, 
the enormity of what had just happened sinking in. The warehouse felt different now, empty, like the darkness had taken something vital with it when it disappeared. I stumbled toward Emily, collapsing into her arms as the adrenaline drained out of me, leaving only exhaustion in its wake, it's over, I whispered, my voice trembling with the aftershocks of fear. It's finally over but as I held her, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still wrong, that the darkness hadn't truly gone away, that it was just waiting, lurking in the shadows, biding its time that we left the warehouse together, the cold night air stinging our wounds. Neither of us spoke as we walked away from that cursed place, too shaken by what we had just survived. But in the back of my mind, I knew that we would never truly be free, that the darkness I had unleashed would always be with us, haunting us, reminding us of the price we had paid and as we walked into the night, I couldn't help but wonder if, in the end, I had become the very monster I had tried to destroy.